You are at Live Streams. Live Streams is a new program here at the church where we want to give you the Word of God in a very practical way. It comes from Psalm 1, that's the name that is, where the happy man or the blessed man is described like a tree that is planted by the waters, and the waters represent the Word of God that streams into the roots, into the life of the person, and his life becomes so much better as a result. And so that's what we're doing. We're going through a series of topics that are relevant to you, hopefully. And that's why you're here, because you know what's up tonight. We're going to talk about some really important things. In fact, we started a series about three weeks ago on anger. And anger is kind of a multi-perspectival thing. It's got a lot of different angles to it. And so we started with anger against God. Hey, this guy, he's got a lot of things going on in his life, but he's angry at God. We started with that, and then we talked about anger towards each other, and then last week we had a very serious one on domestic violence. Well, the fun doesn't stop because tonight we are going to talk about kids and teen anger. So that's our topic for tonight, and it's great to have a bunch of teens in the back. Let's give, a, let's give another hand for the junior hires. Colin already? He is one minute ahead of schedule. But this is our uh, special guest tonight. Pastor Lou, can you hear me? Good, good evening. Yes, I can. Okay. Okay. Give us one second. We are one minute behind schedule, okay? I'm going to introduce you in a sec, but uh, before I do, I, wa I have a very special in-house guest. His name is Dave Kornman, and he is the director of the junior high program here at the church, okay? And so okay. let's give a big hand to Dave Kornman. All right, Dave, come and sit next to Trisha. And uh, Pastor Lou, did you hear all that clapping? I did. All right, we've got a good crowd here tonight. We've got little kids. We've got junior hires. They've got their fancy devices, their iPhones and droids and texting devices, and they're going to listen to what you have to say and uh, respond to it, okay? So that's our plan for tonight, all right? Okay. Well, this, by the way, we're going to give us one more second. We're going to make your face a little bit bigger on the big screens. But everybody, this is Pastor Lou Priolo out of Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, he is uh, still awake. What time is it over there? It's uh, 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock, okay. It's mountain time. Oh, no, no, it's central time. Right. Okay, all right. Well, uh, I've invited Pastor Lou to join us uh, because he has written two very popular books, one for kids' anger called The Heart of Anger, and then recently, you put out another one, a companion to it, kind of like a workbook for teens called Getting a Grip. And so that's why we have the teens here tonight. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, my, Pastor, so, my pleasure. Great, thank you. So Pastor Lou, this is what we're going to do. We're going to, I'm going to just ask you some questions based on the two books that you wrote. And uh, feel free to make comments, uh, knowing that we are up against the clock. And uh, so we'll take brief comments from you. But while you are commenting, we have people in the audience who will text in. And uh, we'll stop at some point to uh, field their text. And they might have a uh, specific question for you. OK? OK. All right, well, let's get started. We're going to talk about child anger from his book, Heart of Anger, OK? And this is Pastor Lou Priolo. So, uh, Pastor Lou, why don't we start off by kind of um, profiling the angry child. Can you do that for me? I know that can be a very long uh, profile, but how would you describe, I mean, we're talking about maybe preschoolers or elementary school kids. What are some adjectives or ways that you describe the angry child? Well, to begin with, of all of the emotions mentioned in Scripture, anger, in one way or another, appears more than any other emotion over 500 times. 
So there are really quite a few of the characteristics of anger that we could identify, that we, we could list. Uh, typically, what I uh, experience when parents want me to talk to their children are things such as outbursts of anger, temper tantrums, uh, argumentation. The children sometimes become very uh, disrespectful. There's fighting, bullying, uh, bitterness, uh, lots of different, oh, they don't use this terminology as they're describing to me what's going on in their household, really different acts of vengeance, verbal acts and actions, uh, 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 physical uh, retaliation. So, I mean, really the sky is the limit. The issue is not so much uh, how the anger is manifested, but that it is uh, that it's anger. Now, again, of those 500 times that anger is mentioned in the Bible, most of the time it's talking about the sinful kind of anger, the kind of anger that the heart of anger that the books really, really were written to address. But there are a few examples in the Bible where there is such a thing as righteous anger. I mean, God gave us anger. When we get angry, when there's a problem in our life, the adrenal glands pump adrenaline into our system and we are, we are ready to go. So anger is not necessarily sinful. God is angry at the wicked every day. Jesus at different places looked at the, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, the hypocrites in anger. You look at Matthew 23 and you see that he's very angry there, but he does not sin. In fact, Paul says, be angry, uh, Ephesians 4, be angry and do not sin. Paul, when he went to Athens, was provoked when he saw the city totally given over to idols and that word provoke is an angry, one of the many anger words in the scripture. Now, the book was written. Uh, I know I'm going well beyond your. That's OK. Uh, Go ahead. You're on a roll. Keep on going. <laughs> so uh, the, the book was written to deal with a certain type of person. I never expected the Lord to bless the book the way he did. I thought I was like dealing with a little niche in the Bible when when we continuously give ourselves over to a particular sin, little by little that sin encroaches upon us and uh, we're, we're bound by the cord of that, the cords of that sin. The sin sort of takes over this area of our life and this area of our life and another area of our life. And at some point, uh, when God looks at us, he categorizes us by the name of the sin that's overtaken us, right? So a person who continuously gives himself over to folly, God calls a, what does he, what does he call someone? Everybody? Oh, good. Okay. What about the person who habitually steals? What does God call him? But the maniac? Thief. No. What does he call him? Thief. A thief, right? Well, the same is true about anger. The Bible in the book of Proverbs especially talks about a type of a person. Make no friendship with an angry man. That's a type of person. And with a furious man, type of person, you shall not go lest you learn his ways and get a snare to your soul. So basically, I wrote the book, you know, years ago to help parents whose children were characterologically angry, children who basically had the characteristics of an angry man, angry young man, angry young woman. Okay, I probably spent enough time on that question. What's the next one? <laughs> well, I, I think what's uh, also very important uh, in your book is you talk about the child-centered home and how I think that will really help the parents tonight to understand kind of the situation in the house and maybe you can define what a child-centered home is and how that would lead to a very angry child. Well, to begin with, let's talk about the way it should be. Our home should not be any one person-centered except Christ-centered, right? It should be a God-centered home where the whole purpose of the home, everyone's existence, uh, everyone lives and their motives are to uh, glorify God, please him in all things. God's will is the most important thing uh, that we all uh, strive for. And our desires and our, our pleasures uh, sometimes have to be sacrificed if God's will determines it. Well, now that's in contrast to a child-centered home. And, and as, I, as I describe what a child-centered home looks like, uh, mom and dad especially, I want you to think about your home through the eyes of your children, okay? How do your children view the home? In a child-centered home, 
uh, the child believes that the, the entire family, mom, dad, siblings, the pets, exist basically for one purpose, and that's to please him and meet his need, uh, to fulfill his desires. And so in a child-centered home, children are allowed to routinely interrupt mom and dad when they're talking to dictate the family schedule. Uh, they're allowed to basically have an equal vote in all decision-making matters. Now, I'm, I'm not saying, uh, mom and dad, you shouldn't get your kids input, but I mean, basically the Christian family is not a democracy. Mom and dad are the head of the home and the children are there and they're an important part of the family and their input should be sought, but we don't make decisions primarily on what the children want to do. We want to make decisions based on what the Bible says. And it, in a child-centered home, the children are uh, allowed to uh, escape consequences for their behavior, to speak to their parents as if they were adults. Uh, I'm sorry, to speak to their parents as if they were their peers, they were children. Um, and so these are just some of the characteristics of a child-centered home. Now, typically when I'm, when I'm working with parents of angry children, um, I'll go to the whiteboard and I will sort of draw a picture on the whiteboard of two different kinds of uh, two different kinds of families: the God-centered family and the child-centered family. And I explain them in a little more detail than I'm able to do tonight. But one of them, I'll say to them, which of these two family best represents your home: the God-centered home or the child-centered home? And almost invariably, they tell me, "Well, we really have a child-centered home." Or they may say, "Well, look, we're trying to have a God-centered home, but right now we have more. We're trying to have a God-centered home." I don't know if I said that right, but right now we have more of a uh, child-centered home, but we're in the process. So, so the bottom home. line is a, a child-centered home basically teaches children to be takers rather than givers, to, to have their needs met rather than meeting the needs of other people, to be selfish rather than to be loving. And of course, love is the ultimate goal, right? First, so, the greatest so, so. commandment is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second greatest is to love our neighbors as ourselves. And by the way, young people, who's your closest neighbor? Mom and dad. Okay, so Pastor Lua, some, some people might say initially uh, that, um, hey, that's a good thing if, the, if everything revolves around me. You know, the home, getting everything they want, their, all their demands and what have you. So uh, specifically, because your book is focused on anger, how does a child centered home produce an angry child? Um, definitely, I mean, it, it, I know where you're going, but can you uh, clarify a little bit more? Because some people tonight might be thinking, well, this child's probably you know, just so happy that everything is uh, centered around him and getting everything that he wants, and schedules are dictated towards him or her. So how does that produce an angry child? Well, I guess the bottom line is that life is not that way. Uh, you know, your mom and dad love you. They're going to try to give you as much as they can give you, meet all of your needs, and certainly fulfill all of your desires as best they can, uh, hopefully without sinning. But in the real world, it's not that way. Most people are not going to be as giving to you as your parents are, and you're not always going to get uh, what you want. So it sort of breeds this uh, discontentment. It sort of breeds this uh, expectation that uh, mom and dad, and ultimately society, owes me a living. And let me sort of explain the connection between uh, our desires, wanting all of these things, and anger. Uh, in the book of James, the Christians to whom James was writing were having serious conflicts with each other. And in chapter 4, he asks them a question, and then he answers it. He says, what is the source of these battles, these fightings, these wars that you are having with each other? I guess it's you guys out there instead of uh, y'all. Is that how it works? What's the source of these conflicts that y'all, that you guys are having with each other? And um, then he answers his own questions. He says, isn't the reason you're having these conflicts, the reason you're, you're basically angry at each other, because of these desires that you have that are at war in your members? Okay, so the word desire there is an interesting word. It's a word that most of the time is translated as a bad desire, but not necessarily. Sometimes it's actually translated as a good desire. So we have this desire, and it's a good desire. Maybe it's a desire, mom and dad, for our children to obey us, or uh, husbands for our wives to respect us, or ladies for your husbands to uh, 
live with you as the Bible says uh, in an understanding way and to communicate with you as the Bible says that you should as the initiator. Um, you know, maybe young people, you have a desire for your parents to provide for you. And all of these things, you know, are not necessarily wrong desires because you've got, what, half a dozen scriptures to substantiate the fact that these desires are not unlawful. They're lawful desires. Okay, everybody with me so far? Okay, Pastor Lou, um, I would give me one second to, to give a plug. If you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to text them in, and Trisha, mm -hmm. you will field them. Yep. And uh, Pastor Lou, it. let's uh, switch topics a little bit and hit this from a different angle, unless you, you okay. look like you I want to say something. I haven't something. finished my answer. Okay, go ahead. Yep. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> go ahead. So basically, when we want some good thing, so much that we're willing to sin in order to get it or to sin because we can't have it, usually by getting angry, that that's indicative of the fact that this desire that we have, uh, even though it's not necessarily sinful, is sinful because we're willing to sin by getting angry when someone keeps us from acquiring what it is that we want. Do you follow? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, let's, uh, let's hit this anger topic, uh, the angry child, okay? Let, let's hit it from the perspective of parenting. And, uh, okay, we, we, can, we can continue to talk about the, the, the angry child himself or herself, but there's, there's the parenting, too, the, the style of parenting that provokes the child to anger and scripture talks a lot about it, doesn't it? Why don't we start there and then you've got some, you've got a list of uh, ways that parents can provoke, but um, there's, there's a couple classic passages, aren't there, Pastor Lou, in the New Testament that talk about provoking the kids to anger. Right, there's one in Colossians that says, I think we mentioned this a moment ago, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger and unless they be discouraged. Um, so sometimes angry kids, in addition to the other characteristics I mentioned before, are sort of apathetic. Uh, and then in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but rather bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And two different words, but they essentially mean uh, the same thing. And of course, there are lots of things that parents can do to provoke their children to anger. Now, I have a rather unusual policy, and I've had it for like 26 years, as long as I've been doing biblical counseling. And the policy basically states that unless there's a crisis or an emergency, I really don't like to spend uh, time with the child, especially the younger children, until I've had two or three sessions with mom and dad. And the reason for that has to do with this passage. There are 168 hours in a week. If I spend one hour a week with Johnny trying to help him um, deal with his anger and disrespect issue, but I send him back in, into a home where mom and dad are pushing his buttons 167 hours a week. My time with Johnny is not going to be nearly as effective as it would otherwise be. So what I want to do is spend some time with mom and dad, teach, uh, help them understand and understand for myself what it is that they may be doing to provoke their children to anger, help them identify those things and begin to remove those things so that when I do get a chance to talk with Johnny, I'm sending him home into an environment where mom and dad are making it easier for him to change rather than hard for him to change. Also, another reason I want to meet with parents, not only initially, but throughout the entire process, uh, again, depending on the circumstance, is because it's not my job to, sh to shepherd Johnny. I want mom and dad there to teach them how to shepherd, how to pastor, how to counsel their children. And so even though I may be spending a lot of time talking to Johnny, I want mom and dad to see how I do this. So that's why we do it. Okay, now, now you know, in terms of, uh, in, the, in the book, In the Heart of Anger, I identify like 25 of them, I think the most common ways that mom and dad provoke their children to anger. Uh, the most common one, I think the one that we have to deal with most often is when mom and dad um, don't have marital harmony. In fact, sometimes I have to put Johnny on the back burner and help mom and dad get their marriage straightened out and the bitterness resolved between the two of them before I can really start working with Johnny. Um, but Ephesians, uh, no, sorry, um, yeah, Hebrews chapter 12 says that we should be looking diligently lest we fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble us, and thereby many be defiled. 
And first in line for the defiling impacts of bitterness between mom and dad, of course, are the children. Sometimes we've actually not even had to see the children because by helping mom and dad get their uh, marriage back on track biblically, uh, the problem with Johnny goes away. So that's the first thing we look. How many of these do you want me to go through? I mean, they're well, like there's I said, 25, 25 and we, I want to, uh, I'm looking at the clock, Pastor Lou, and we've got maybe about six, seven minutes left. There's no okay. way we can cover all 25, but I'm going to just list a couple here that I thought were quite provocative and uh, see nope. if you right. might want to comment on any of these. And again, I don't have time to list all 25, but here's some that I thought were interesting. Uh, number three, well, number one was lack of marital harmony that you just commented on. Number three is modeling sinful anger. Number four. Hey, let, me, let me comment on that one if you don't that's mind. That's a good one. Go ahead. I mean, lots of different ways that we model sinful anger, but there are two basic ways that, uh, that, two basic ways that we tend to get angry in and, 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 and unbiblical ways. On, on one extreme, we internalize it. We keep it all in. Right, we sulk, we pout, we withdraw, um, we go for a walk, we just sort of, you know, uh, give the other person the cold shoulder. Uh, on the other hand, some people blow up; they ventilate their anger, right? Like Mount Vesuvius, they they use bad language, they raise their voice, they shout, they hit, they kick, they bite, and so these are the two extremes that people tend to um, to utilize when they are angry. Uh, a friend of mine likens anger to this. He says, anger is an emotion that God gave us to destroy something. And rather than destroying ourselves by internalizing the anger, and rather than destroying the other person at whom we're angry by ventilating, we really need to learn as Christians to get that adrenaline, to get that anger under the Spirit's control and direct it towards the problem. Now, nine times out of ten, the problem has to do with another person. So what is almost always necessary in order to get the anger from our heart to the problem to the other person is communication. And when you, mis when, you, when you clam up, you're not communicating. When you blow up, you're miscommunicating. Bottom line, the greatest way that we model sinful anger is with our words. And if we have a problem with anger, there's really little hope for us to get it under control unless and until we learn how to communicate biblically. And the Bible has lots and lots to say about communication. All right, this is all good stuff, Pastor Lou. I'm going to... I'm going to read to you uh, some of my favorites in this list of 25 ways to provoke your kids to anger. And uh, we Maybe only have... you mean the ones that you do most often, Pastor? Is that what you mean by favorites? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm confessing right now. So I, I'm going to, just because of time, I'm just going to list a few. And you pick one that you want to comment on. And then we need to talk a little bit more specifically about teen anger, okay? But let me okay. just read you a few here. Um, number four, disciplining while angry. Number six, being inconsistent with discipline. Ten, constantly finding fault. Thirteen, comparing them to others. Sixteen, failing to keep your promises. Seventeen, chastening in front of others. Eighteen, not allowing enough freedom. And 19, allowing too much freedom. Well, there's a, there's a lot you more pick, there, but can you just pick one, one and comment like on any comment one of those? On. I'm sorry, go ahead. You pick one. I'll be happy to comment on any one. Which would you like me to address? Well, I think one thing, because we live with our kids, number 10 is the one that I think we're all guilty of because we see their sins so I mean, readily. It's right in front of us, and this, this temptation where constantly finding fault and there's that temptation to always nitpick and find something wrong with them and I can see all of us uh, falling into that trap where we see where we don't compliment or encourage enough but we're just constantly you know just uh, nailing them to the wall you know this is a big problem um, in Christian circles for Christian parents because we're so concerned about our children's character, we're so concerned about correcting them, about instructing them, about wanting them to be Christ-like, and there just seems like an endless, uh, you know, list of topics that we need to be correcting them on. Um, but the thing we have to remember, first of all, is that we're all a work in progress. Secondly, that if God showed you and I, Pastor, all of our sins that we still have to correct between now and the time when the Lord comes, I mean, it would be overwhelming. So, I mean, realistically, we really 
can't expect our kids to focus on more than one or two at a time. Not that we ignore the other ones, but we can't focus on all of these things that we're working on. The passage that comes to mind is the passage in Revelation chapter 2, where the Lord rebukes the Ephesian church for losing their first love. He commends them for like 14 or 15 different things. And then he says, nevertheless, I have something against you. And so we see even, even the Lord Jesus, when he was reproving the church in Ephesus, commended them first before he reproved them. There's a brand new book. Actually, it's probably about six or eight months old that we're using in our counseling center. Actually, my wife and I are going through it. The book is called Practicing Affirmation by a man named Sam Crabtree. It's a very, very good book. I, I thought I knew what the Bible had to say for the most part about affirmation. And I want to tell you, this guy really, really nails it. So I would recommend for parents or even husbands and wives, for anyone who has a critical, condemnatory, judgmental, accusmental, accusatory attitude, to get a hold of this book, um, it'll be a, a real blessing to you. Okay, Pastor Lou, we're running out of time, but I want to give the junior hires mm -hmm. and the people here a chance to text in a question. Mm -hmm or comment. We got some. So Trisha, uh, Trisha Davies is fielding the questions and Pastor Lu, she is going to uh, read one of the texts that came in while you are speaking and if you will comment on it. Go ahead, Trisha. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to wrap, we got quite a few so I'm just going to wrap up a couple of main thoughts. Um, back, going back to the Christ-centered God, or the child-centered, God-centered home, um, is there such thing as being too strict in in trying to raise your child in that God-centered home where the parents are the the um, you know the kids answer to the parents all the time. But how can you? Um, I'm trying to wrap up like five questions in this one. Um, so how can you um, have a nice balance of of like you said of discipline and um, a little bit of independence on the child's part in making decisions? Um, also, since I've got you here, um, is there in a couple of parent questions? Is there a thing as praising your kid too much? And also, um, there's another one here. Um, go? I, I'm going to forget go the first two. It's okay. We don't go ahead. stop here. Go so, ahead. Uh, I, the, the first question, yes, of course. I mean, the answer to both mm -hmm. is yes, of course, you can praise too much to the exclusion mm -hmm. of uh, reproof. Uh, and you can certainly uh, reprove so much and reprove even with a critical spirit that it becomes out of balance. I mean, I, I really think the best short answer I can give you, if you suspect at all that you're out of balance, sit your children down and ask them, hey, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate me in terms of commending you and praising you and affirming you compared to how I spend so much time trying to help you grow and, and you know, disciplining you? Let, listen to the children. See if maybe they can help you understand it from their point of view. Okay. I mean, I think you need to go, as it were, straight uh, to the horse's mouth. Another question you want to ask them, I think, is this. Um, on a scale of 1 to 10, how reasonable am I? I mean, what percentage of the time do you would you say that you have a fighting chance to get me to change my mind once I've made a decision? The you know, Bible says the wisdom from above is reasonable. It's easily entreated. Now, another point I want to make about that, um, in the second book, in uh, Getting a Grip, there's a chapter in there called How to Talk to Your Parents About Their Sin. Now, of course, I talk about how when you do that, you have to be first willing to get the beam out of your own eyes. But if you have parents that are believers and you do it respectfully, uh, there is plenty of biblical precedence for you going to your parents politely, respectfully, having first gotten the beam out of your own eye and talking to them about the things that you think they are doing that are sinful and are, in fact, provocative to you. Okay, Trisha, okay. do you have another one? Yeah, I do. Um, a couple more parenting questions. Um, is catching a child sassing back a good precursor to preventing an overly angry child? I didn't hear the first part of the question. Is, is what? Is catching a child sassing back or talking back a good precursor to preventing an overly angry child? Well, sure, because, I mean, like we said, communication and anger sort of go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And so what we have done in our home, depending on how bad the sassiness is, uh, I mean, if it's blatant, then we have to certainly discipline them for that. For that. 
But, I mean, I'm real big on giving the kids a chance for a redo. They say something disrespectful, all right, honey, can you please try that again without the sarcasm? Can you try that again in the form of a question rather than making an accusation? Mm -hmm. Can you try that again without rolling your eyes? I wasn't rolling my eyes. I'm looking right at you. You were rolling your eyes. Really, you were. Can we please try it again? You know, so trying to get the... And basically, if the children are willing to give you a redo and, you're, and, and will listen to your uh, correction, then to me, that's even better than having to discipline them. You know, the Bible, the Bible says the rod and reproof give wisdom. I talk about this in my other parenting book, Teach Them Diligently. God never intended discipline to be used by itself. It's it's the rod plus reproof that give wisdom. It's discipline, you know, discipline with deep in it, but it also is communication. When my counselees disobey God's word, I don't take them over my knee and spank them. I've got to rely on doctrine, on conviction, on uh, correction, and on discipline, training, and righteousness, all of which I do from the word of God. Okay. So um, that's what works in our home. Okay. Yeah, Pastor Lou, I think we've got one more. One more, How yeah. One more, and this is, um, doesn't seem like a parenting question. Um, how do I handle my anger when my father constantly provokes and bullies me to anger? He does not live with me. He does not live with me. So how do I handle my anger when my father constantly provokes and bullies me to anger? Yeah, you know, that's a question that's going to be very hard to answer right. <laughs> accurately and rightly without asking at least a dozen more questions. I mean, for example, right. I'd have to know if your father is a believer, is not, is not a believer. Mm -hmm. Again, you'd have to, you, you'd have to um, um, make sure that you've got, gotten the beam out of your own eye. I mean, I, I really think that the best advice I can give you without, as the Bible warns me against in Proverbs 18, answering a matter before I hear it, is to you know, refer you to that chapter in my book that says how to talk to your parents about their sin. The short answer is if your father is a believer, you know, the, probably the best thing you can do is, is sit down with him and say, look, I know that I have really been um, uh, whatever in these areas, these areas, these areas, and ask your father to forgive you for the things that you've done wrong. And there's a checklist actually in getting a grip to help you to do this. And then when you've done that, then to try to reason with him, to try to appeal to him, to try to talk to him about the things that he is doing that you find provocative. Um, if he's not a Christian, it's not that difficult. It's not that easy. In a situation like that, I think the best advice I can give you, and this is good advice even if your parents are believers, is to sit down with uh, uh, an elder in the church, a pastor, someone that you trust can give you advice from God's word and let him help you with that as well as maybe even role play with you to teach you to make sure that you're approaching your father in the right way. Pastor Lou, you have been very generous with your time. I know it's getting late all the way over there in Alabama. We want to thank you so much for giving us your time. I know you spoke uh, at another event prior to uh, joining us tonight, so you must be exhausted. Um, everyone, let's give him a big hand, Pastor Lou. Thank you very much. It's, it's been a pleasure to be here. Maybe we can do Thank this again sometime. Thank you so sometime. much. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, we can uh, Skype you again later. But God bless and have a good night. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, we need to wrap it up in five minutes. We are on schedule. And so Don't junior hires, hear Dave? listen up, okay, everybody, listen up. Those are the books that, are, that he wrote. A Heart of Anger is for Children, and he wrote it to the parents, okay? And so we spent a lot of time talking about the child-centered home. Uh, he goes over 25 ways that a parent can provoke, that stimulate. That's uh, Ephesians 6 and Colossians chapter 3. That's what he talked about. Go over that. That's good stuff uh, inside there. And then, um, again, if, if you just remember his name, lupriolo.com, you can go there and, and uh, see these two books. Uh, the second book is a spinoff, and it's actually written to the junior hires. 
to the high schoolers, okay? Not to the parents, but the content is pretty similar. It's kind of just uh, reworked so that uh, the, the teen can, can look at it. But as he mentioned, it's got some additional stuff, such as how does a teen talk to an angry parent? So there's good stuff in there at all. That's uh, uh, getting a grip. But we are almost out of time. But uh, Dave, uh, some of your thoughts as you are listening to that, your experiences. I'm sure as a youth pastor, you've run into situations where there's maybe way too much emotion. But uh, what are your thoughts as you were listening to it? Oh, man. Um, a lot of thoughts. I, I think, uh, I don't know, who would you like me to speak most to? I'm guessing uh, whoever, the junior you hires. You can speak to the parents, but you can speak to your junior hires, sure, too. Hey, sure. that's fine. I, th I think, um, you know, if we're talking about anger, I think the biggest thing for, for students to understand, or, or to try and understand, is first of all, to identify what's making me angry. Because I know a lot of times, um, kids can get angry and they become so consumed by not only the anger, but what they want to do with that anger, that they lose sight of what is originally triggering that anger. And so I think when, when we focus on that, what's making me angry, and then, then taking steps to resolve that. And then uh, I think the second thing. Well, before you go there, oh, that's good okay. insight, Dave, because uh, Luke Priolo also mentioned the James chapter 4. What, what causes the quarreling? Isn't it the desires of your heart? Mm -hmm. And you're just taking it to the next step of, hey, go ahead and examine that heart and find out what's going on inside there that is making you very angry. And in fact, in the book, that's why it's called The Heart of Anger, there's a huge emphasis on examining the heart. So you're on the right trail there. Cool. Okay. Keep on. What's your second point? Uh, my, my second point is um, when we're confronted with conflict, the really cool thing is that Jesus provided a lot of examples in the Bible of how to handle conflict. We see multiple times where where Jesus, um, he's, he straight up avoids conflict. There, there We have the scene in John where, where the angry mob wants to throw him off the cliff. Right, and, he, he, and what does he do? He just walks away. just walks away. And, um, because Jesus in his infinite wisdom realized that was the best thing to do at that moment. Um, we see, uh, when we see uh, the, the people bringing the adulterous woman to him and saying, uh, we should stone this woman, right, Jesus? How does he handle the conflict? Through reason and through wisdom. And he, he talks to the people about it. And then we also see Jesus in the, in the temple with the money changers with righteous anger. And so I think the thing for students and probably all of us to, to realize is when we're confronted with different kinds of conflict in our lives, we have an example to look to. And, um, and it just takes us using our, our wisdom, our discernment, and saying, how can I best handle this conflict right now? And so I would like to encourage you guys to do that. Yeah, and... and in some ways, it's bad to stop on that note because it's a great, I, I wish that that being such an important point, I, I wish we could talk all night and get into like bullying mm -hmm. and yeah. things that are really going on in the schools. Mm -hmm. And maybe in the future, we'll have a special session on bullying because mm -hmm. it's really getting out of control right now. Yeah. And all the suicides that are happening because of that, you know, they call it now bully side. So it's a really big deal. And so this really is kind of like a can of worms, isn't it, Dave? We're Absolutely. open, all we've done is opened up a huge can of worms, but at the same time, I appreciated what he did is he really uh, brought it back to how we can take this anger, and Pastor Luke kind of tried to do that. There's a righteous uh, form of it where we can do the right things with the anger. It's not just suck it up and don't be angry, but let's mm -hmm. do something with this anger, and that's an important part of uh, this whole process as well. But hey, what can we do with the little time that we have? But before you guys go in junior hires, listen up. Um, Trisha, you want to promote that one more time? Yeah, five-minute energy. Um, life can get busy, especially for a teen on the go. So pull this out and check it out. It's really quick. Um, I'm going to get some of those, and we're going to yeah. stock them in the youth hall so that kids yeah. can grab them. These are awesome, you guys. Pastor Tay worked really hard on this to try and really touch on those, those little things that you might go through every day. And he even has a little um, thing that he wrote in my back pocket. It's, it's um, from him that he, it talks about his um, childhood as a teen and one small devotional book that he had all beat up in his office. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that really made a huge difference to him when he just needed that little bit of energy, that little bit of spiritual recharging to get him through his day or just something to refer to. So, and I know um, when you guys are really busy, this is just a real quick on the go um, spiritual recharger. 
for you. So yes. really take advantage of it. Uh, There'll be more. I think anybody can read it and benefit because I try to yeah. write, get to the point, but sure. I really did write it for the junior hires. Mm -hmm. And so junior hires, and even if you're in fifth or sixth grade, uh, this is for you. So I hope you can pick it up tonight and be blessed by it. I mean, so. I was reading it and I was like, oh, okay, I'll just take this down because <laughs> it works for me too. So, <laughs> Well, we are so pleased tonight that the uh, junior hires and Dave Corman accepted our invite to join us. Hey, wasn't it great to have them join us tonight? Let's give them a big hand. Yeah. I hope that this is the beginning of many opportunities where we can get together and talk about life-relevant topics. And so this is great. And uh, if you have a junior hire um, or, or whatever, I don't know what you're going to do the rest of the night, Dave, but we have a prayer meeting that's going to start in about 30 seconds. If you have any prayer requests, put them inside the red mailbox. We'll pick them up and we'll pray for you tonight. But the night is young. If you don't have to go, please join us. Soma, we'll go meet in the gym. You. So I'm going to go to the gym. <laughs> Rest of us, go to the small chapel or stay here and clean up. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Bye-bye. So hard to get through all the questions. I, kind. I want everybody to be heard, especially when the guests can answer. I'm not